Welcome to Let's Roger That. I'm Jill. Well, in this episode, I'm back with some more surfers grinder challenges. One of the viewers provided some input regarding the fit of my bearings on the shaft journal uh, of my uh, spindle. And uh, what he was saying is that perhaps I should have uh, put some Loctite on there to make sure that it would stay on. Uh, because if it was not a floating bearing, or, or if it was not a bearing meant to be floating, then uh, of course it needs interference, which means it needs to mesh with the shaft as it turns. Because logically, if it doesn't, there's going to be some looseness, and looseness on a surface grinder would lead to some additional vibration, which would, you know, result in bad surface finish. So that got me thinking that I needed to do more research regarding bearings, uh, what the, their fits and tolerances should be uh, when it comes to uh, shaft fitment. Um, and uh, I dove right in. So first of all, I went and looked at the specifications for the SKF uh, bearings that I got, which are 6205's 2RSH. And those are very good bearings uh, from reputation, uh, from what I read. And uh, so then I went to, yes, the Machinery's Handbook. And let me tell you, there's a lot of information in there. And, and although it took me a full day to sort of decipher the information, you don't need to be an engineer to figure out that uh, there are different tolerances that are required in order to achieve um, a lesser amount of vibration uh, from uh, your, your setup. So what I did is I um, looked back and sure enough, the fits were very loose uh, when it comes to bearings sitting on the journals, especially at the back of the spindle. So the Machinery's Handbook recommends taking multiple measurements on those surfaces. And although they were all concentric and parallel to my surface plate, the fact is that the diameters of those surfaces were too small so as a result, they did not provide an interference fit on uh, the bearing uh, internal diameter. Um, so that, that's a huge issue. I thought of perhaps making, uh, you know, groovy, turning that down, making sleeves, but uh, that's not gonna be possible. So the next step is going to be making a brand new spindle and uh, while I'm at this, I'm looking at the design to make sure that everything allows for uh, the least amount of vibration possibilities as it goes forward. So this is quite the exercise. Uh, and what I'm gonna do first is sort of introduce you to some of the uh, tolerance requirements that are specified by SKF and by the Machinery's Handbook. So let's dive in. Okay, so first of all, let's um, iterate something that is important to note here. Uh, the measurements that are um, specified are all in the tenths of thousands of an inch. So not for the faint hearted, uh, you're gonna have, if you need to make one of these uh, spindles, uh, your lathe is going to have to be really well tuned and and uh, and all that. So, uh, so we'll start with that. Now, let me reach for my glasses here. And so, what I've got here is the specifications, you know, uh, for the six two zero five two R S H bearings. And uh, so here it notes the sizes, the dimensions, um, and, uh, and those are important because we need to know what the bore diameter is, the outside diameter, and the width. That's primarily what we need from this chart. Now, uh, something that is uh, noteworthy is that 
uh, SKF uh, mentions that you should have interference fits that meet the standards J5 or K5 um, when it comes to the uh, uh, inner bore of the bearing. Now, J5, in, to save you, save you a lot of headaches, uh, basically we're talking about having a shaft that's two-tenths of a thousandth of an inch bigger than the inside diameter of the bearing. And then the K5 fitment asks for uh, four-tenths of one-thousandth of an inch larger shaft than the inner diameter of the bearing. That allows for tighter fits, less vibration, and then of course this is this is stated in order to get uh, precision out of your setup. So that that's the reference in the machinery's handbook, and you'll see that the specifications from bearing manufacturers uh, quote all these uh, numbers. So if you see these things, these letters and whatnot, that's what these are. Now I'll put up a uh, uh, a little bit of a diagram that I found online, very helpful. Gives you a visual uh, uh, a visual of what the difference uh, are in all these, uh, these different fits. Okay, so, um uh, the uh, one of the primary objectives of this exercise was to make sure that uh, this space here, which was clearly damaged and had been reworked by somebody and not very successfully at that, uh, wanted to make sure that it met the either the J5 or the K5 uh, uh, fit, and uh, it simply does not. So let me give, show you a diagram of basically what this thing looks like. Uh, you know, basically the the sizes simply don't fit. So what I've got here is a requirement for 984 thousandths. That's the uh, the bore diameter of the bearing. And so uh, essentially the shaft should be at least two thousandths of an inch or two tenths of a thousandths of an inch larger. And uh, when you look at this here, that is the smaller diameter, which is... Uh, 876 uh, thousandths and eight tenths. Uh, now I went in the hundredths as well, but uh, bottom line, it's too small, you see? And so when I drew a rough diagram of what actually it looks like from my uh, measurements, one, two, three, four measurements, you see that it, it doesn't even touch the uh, inside diameter of the bearing. So. Uh, and uh, to confirm that, what I did is I looked at the bearing because I had stoned that thing and I can see scuffs from the bearing turning on the shaft. And when I looked on the inside diameter of the bearing, it showed something similar as well. So let's see if we can actually focus on this thing here. Uh, you can see there's some marking happening inside this bearing inside diameter so clearly it's spinning on the shaft and that is not desirable so already I need to replace the bearings and that's okay because I've got a second set I, <laughs> I was hoping to use them in a few years but here we are uh, so bottom line here uh, when I looked at this I thought okay perhaps I can turn this down make a sleeve to go over top lock tight it in not gonna happen uh, it's simply not going to happen. Also, I need to, uh, you know, th this should be better, a better surface. So I might as well start from scratch. The second part that had to be measured was uh, this bearing journal here. And as it turns out, it is three thousandths of an inch undersized. So clearly, <laughs> they it's not working you know like that when we we're uh, you know a few episodes back I was moving this thing and and well guess this what this was the part that was actually clicking three thousandths of an inch is way too much uh, clearance it, it needs to be 
you know, this bearing journal needs to be much larger. So uh, there's no other way to, to take on this. It's got to be reworked. But before you do that, uh, it's pretty important to, you know, take this opportunity to look at what's going on and uh, make sure that I can rectify or, you know, re-engineer the, the problems so that I can avoid these issues. Now here, as you can see, let me zoom in on this. Come in a bit. Now here, what's happening is you've got a very large sur, you know, a very long surface. Well, at some point, the bearing needs to sit against something, or currently it sits around here, right? And then if I, when I the uh, the sleeve goes on top, this is the nut that goes in and sits against the outside diameter of the bearing. Now, hopefully you can see a little bit better now. Uh, but essentially, if you look at this knot here, see there's a protruding outside diameter here, and that's to sit on the outside of the bearing. And so when you're talking, when you're talking about preloading, they mean pressure on the inner sleeve going one way and then the outside going the other just to preload the bearing slightly so they touch the the opposite sides of the the ring inside so this here one tighten inside the the sleeve i showed you should be able to press against the outside portion of the bearing creating some preload but you don't want to go nuts on this thing so uh, I need to allow uh, for this to touch the bearing, but without being able to touch, you know, to press too much. So I need, I need to gauge that. Now this here is where it was currently sitting, at the bearing uh, inner race was sitting against. Well, as it turns out, there's about 800 thousandths uh, of free space where the bearings can basically float from one, you know, forward and backwards. And I don't think that's a desirable function. So I need to deal with this. Let me just turn this so I can show you some marks that I made. Here we are. Currently, this the bearing sits here. And I want it to sit here. So when I make the new shaft, I'm going to extend the... Um, the the, the 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 shoulder that comes out to sit against this portion of the bearing. I'm mean, gonna bring it out. That way this will be sandwiched to get you know correctly inside uh the this this bearing area. Now this is kind of an interesting design. This the the, the sleeve itself here does not latch on to here. It actually uh, the bear, the diameter of this here is larger than the shaft because the shaft turns and this is held inside the surface grinder spindle casing, right? And that's why there's this locking area here. So given that, the I measured this, the inside diameter of this sleeve, and sure enough, it's two tenths of one thousandths of an inch smaller than the outside diameter of this bearing, which is perfect because that creates an interference fit. So you, you, you want the outside diameter of the bearing not to move. And you want the inside diameter of the bearing to move with the shaft. These are all independent. So, and the same is true at the very back of the spindle, and I verified that that the outside diameter uh, is going to be interference fit with the casing of the, the or the housing. The easiest way to figure things out is to actually do it when everything is put together. So, here's what I've done. So that's the cap for that sleeve, right? And I already know before I put the bearings in, that this 
can go in another eighth of an inch this way as needed. You know, once the sleeve is on top. This thing, right? The sleeve used to go to right here. Sleeve used to go right here. That was the edge of it once everything is in. Now you see here, there's no shoulder stop for those bearings or a bearing shoulder on this journal. So I'm creating one, but I needed to know the measurement and I need to, I, I think it's wise to give myself an extra 16th of an inch. So I'm gonna put that shoulder 16th of an inch from the edge of the bearing. That way the inner bearing, the ID is gonna go against this, 16th of an inch this way, that can go an eighth or more inward. So that'll mean, you know, like at very worst, I'll have a preload of 16th of an inch. Now, I, I don't think that would be recommended. Um, I should probably, you know, re even reduce that a little bit more by pushing that shoulder another 16th of an inch. I, I'm not sure yet. But that's, that's where I'm going with this. I need to create some preload when this nut is inside the sleeve and bottomed out. So I've explained the whole thing. It took forever. I guess it's time to make a spindle. So here I am at the lathe with my one and three quarter inch 4140 bar stock. The spindle is going to be 18 inches. So there's, uh, we definitely need some additional support to, to hold this. Earlier I set up a uh, steady rest right here. And then I face this part. Now, just so that you know, over this whole area here, like this is about 20 inches from the chuck is I've got to run out of approximately um, half a thousandth of an inch, which is pretty amazing. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to bring this down to the diameter uh, for uh, the larger part of the spindle. The reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to put my steady rest. You know, I'll have a nice surface. It's not going to be rough. I'll re-indicate everything. Stop makes absolutely sure I'm uh, right on the money and then I'm gonna start carving out the different features and there's about 20 features to be done here so there's quite a bit of stuff uh, now so I didn't bore you with any of the measuring indicating and whatnot but as we go along there's gonna be plenty for this video so if you have questions shoot me a comment or something but I'm gonna skip that part of the, 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 the part uh, I'm going to skip that part of the video with the, the whole measuring thing. Okay, so let's let's continue. So I've taken down 45 thousandths across the whole length because there was some corrosion and whatnot. I wanted to bring this into roundness. It's warm, I'm gonna let it cool off slightly. Then I'm going to take my measurements for uh, to see that the, di the, the diameter is the same throughout. Uh, then after that, I'm going to take a reading lengthwise to see, and then after that, It'll be time to pick a location for my steady rest and then start working on the features. One of the interesting things that showed up is after I took my measurements, um, I found a discrepancy, a discrepancy of approximately uh, five plus thousandths of an inch from here to here. And that made no sense, this being smaller. 
And then I thought, okay, took my measurement two, three more times. Then I thought, okay, fair enough. So if that's happening, um, then clearly my tail stock is not aligned and it's making me cut a taper. So what I did is I put a, a dial indicator over here, went right along, confirmed that it was six thousandths of an inch, reduced, you know, pushed the tail stock in this direction and it deflects when you actually tighten it down. So you have to take that into account. Um, so I did all that. Now I'm going to cut again to see, I'm going to start at zero here and it should cut six thousandths into the shaft at this end. Taking another cut and I wanted to remeasure to see where things were at, whether my tailstock was properly aligned. And well, first of all, let me just say that it was important to do this with the full diameter because then I can run a test indicator from here all the way here. And then, you know, I have comparative measurements uh, on the um, diameter. So I uh, couldn't trust my old caliper or a micrometer so I got one shipped overnight and this one is five numbers back right so check this out now I feel better so this is at the tail stock right and this is at the chuck so I've got five one hundredths of a thousandth of an inch in difference. That's not even one tenth of a thousandth of an inch. I'm happy with that. But there's an un, uh, here's some more interesting in, uh, numbers here um, about deflection. Now this is a 20 inch from the chuck to here, right? So check this out. So here we got five hundredths of a thousand different. Here we got exact measurement, yeah. And now we're starting to have larger diameters in the middle. And they always talk about deflection. So this is a great example that as your tool pushes or, or if there's too much pressure on your tail stock, between your tail stock and the, the chuck, you know, the, the piece can actually bend. I don't think that's the case because it's not tightened very hard. That's why I got good measurements. Um, but nevertheless, you know, something to consider. Now this is not gonna be a practical uh, portion of the spindle. This is just the large part that's gonna stay uh, at uh, 1.68, so it clears the sleeve. But these areas here, from here to here, and here to here, are critical. So I'm gonna make sure as I go that my uh, piece stays uh, in good, within the good uh, tolerances. I mean, this is a spindle for a surface grinder, so it's gotta be pretty exact. And my whole goal is to try to uh, reduce some of the surface imperfections. So anyhow, good to know. Now I can continue. I'm gonna turn this down to, uh, let me see, 1.68 or something like that. Just double, triple check my measurements. Yes, 1.68 in diameter. All right, All right. I've got this. Uh, shaft turned down to the uh, maximum outside diameter for the non-mechanical part. But the important part is that I wanted it to be um, as concentric as possible, like within a few tenths, if at all possible. I was shooting for two or tenths or less. 
So here's what I've got so far. At this end, the end where the spindle nose is going to be, this is the measurement I've got, right? 65265. At the other end, this is the pulley end, I've got 16528. That's a difference of 1.5 tenths of one thousandth. I think that's acceptable. I've had to carve out a lot more than I wanted out of this. In fact, it was, well, nearly 28 thousandths more. But that is not an issue simply because the sleeve that accepts the um, bearings is not connected to this shaft at all. So that's a non-issue. It just needed to be smaller so that it clears that sleeve. So I'm gonna leave it like this. So this is day two, <laughs> just to get this done. Let me tell you that has been very challenging. Um, so now I might, you know, I would could probably, if, if this was required, I'd probably consider making it smoother. But at this point, I'm gonna leave it alone because it's in great shape. And this, these measurements is what I want. And I find that this here, a tailstock, and of course mine is extended a little bit so that I, you know, I could clear everything. But the tailstock pretty well needs to be adjusted every time you make a pass. And, or at the very least, you need to measure. Like when you're talking about a piece of stock this long uh, with the tolerances that I'm trying to get, it, you have no choice but to remeasure every single time and adjust, you know, because uh, it takes nearly nothing to create a taper. So, just a little piece of advice for you. Look at that finish. Wow. All right, so my measurement is 1.0643. And I need to bring it down to 984 thousandths and seven tenths. That's a difference of 79.6 thousandths. I want to divide that in equal parts, so I'll do it in four steps. So that means I have to take 19.9 thousandths of an inch on each cut. So I'm gonna leave two thousandths at the end. So the last one I'll take uh, probably 16 thousandths off. Well, it's all over but the worrying now. <laughs> all right, we'll take a quick measurement here and see where we are. Yeah, it's not, over, not overly hot, I can touch it. I can't believe this, I overshot. Yep. Nine eighty three. Overshot by one thousandth of an inch. Oh my god. <laughs>